Welcome to Building Tomorrow, a show about how tech and innovation can make us all merry and bright. I hope you enjoyed your Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, or just playing old day off work with friends. But now New Year's is on the horizon, that time of sincere resolve to change your life next year for the better, and then never using that new gym membership ever again. In that spirit, we're going to discuss the ways that digital tech have changed our routines, but even more significantly, even our basic brain chemistry in all kinds of unintended and often harmful ways. Uh, the too long, don't, didn't read version, your brain's been hacked. And what we should consider then doing about that. As usual, I'm your host, Paul Matsko. With me are Will Duffield and Aaron Powell. To start, let's lay down a baseline. Okay, we're talking about like smartphone use to, to get real simple. How old were you guys when you got your first smartphone? And to define that, like let's say a phone that could and you did use to go online. It's not just like phone text. Um I mid mid high school, I got a hand me down Blackberry from my uncle, which I guess was the first internet phone I had. I had Twitter before it actually really? on a yeah. dumb phone and it was great because it was one of the few ways you could get live news updates through SMS because you could follow oh, like yeah. CNN breaking news and that. set them. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it it was certainly when, when internet yeah. phones were pretty new because there weren't any limits on tethering at that mm -hmm. point. Um, and at at my high school, you couldn't use the school network for all sorts of, you know, gaming, movies, whatever else. And I was pulling like seven, eight gigs a month through this <laughs> tether connection on this that Blackberry. Was a lot so then, I really yeah. used it. My first smartphone was less a smartphone and more of a wireless modem. I will now distinguish myself in age from Will by answering. <laughs> I think I was either 30 or 31. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, it was shortly after finishing law school, moving out to DC to work at Cato. And I got, it was the T-Mobile like G2. It was one of the early Android phones and it was terrible. Um, but that was, that was my first. So I, I went through all of my childhood and all of my college years and all of my law school years without a smartphone. I did have an iPod Touch in law school, which I guess is kind of like a smartphone that only works when you're in the building. You had Wi-Fi though, so you could, yeah, yeah. You I'm, had Wi-Fi and you, you could use the internet, but it was very interesting with, you know, that first generation of smartphones. It wasn't an app ecosystem yet. No. It was, you know, basically a miniature, it was a web browser that you could carry around. You could check your email, but... Beyond that, I don't really remember what functionality yeah, yeah. Um, I was making use of. Well, I think for – at least for me, I mean I'm in college is when I had my first smartphone. But the the stuff that we associate with smartphone use among – well, especially teenagers now is stuff that you did on a computer, right? So like AOL, AOL Instant Messenger, right? Like that was our version of texting. ICQ of text was ICQ what series. I used okay. in high school. Really? And, and enough of your high school compadres were also on or, ICQ? Uh, my my nerdy friends, yes. Um, all of us fancied ourselves computer hacker sorts were on ICQ and there was the, the competition about your – because you're – you didn't have a user ID. Like you didn't have a username in ICQ. You had a number and it was just a sequential number. So it was like this is the number of users who signed up. So there was the – you know, you were super cool if you had – a low ICQ number. Yeah. I have no idea what mine was. So I, I, I mean, I think what's what's striking about this is that so some of the stuff we're going to be talking about here, it, we're doing a giant experiment on an entire generation of American, really Gen Z, I suppose, who are the founders is what they asked to be called. The in founders. A, a recent uh, MTV did a survey of what they'd like their generation to be named, and the the winning was the founders. Founders of what? What are they founding? It's, it's not. We've got to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That has a little bit too much of uh, like new, new founding fathers vibe yeah, to me. Yeah. Uh, maybe I've just watched too many of those purge movies. <laughs> yeah, but, I didn't. Um, I didn't have a strong that, opinion that of this generation. Me the wrong way a little bit. Yeah. I didn't have a strong opinion of this generation until I saw that, and I was like, maybe they could be worse than the millennials. <laughs> Hey, hey, 
give us our avocado toast. Give us our we're we're doing all right there, and you bitter Gen X. Uh, yeah, Gen Xers here. don't have any you know no viable presidential candidates really. They're getting beat by a bunch of septuagenarians. Um, we invented you're like the all missing, the stuff you're you guys the missing think is generation. Awesome. Frankly, there, there is a version. I'm not gonna say it's likely, but there's a version of the future in which we just skip from the last baby boomer president, Donald Trump, or let alone Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders <laughs> next cycle, um, from Donald Trump to a millennial. Well, we're going to get Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know? Yeah, it's it's yeah. only uh, only men that have to wait until 35. <laughs> we, should, we should get back on topic because I can see Tess, our producer in there, is kind of... <laughs> Are you distraught? Yeah, she's a little restive. Okay, so we're we're back on topic. Oh, we've established that we are older than the the folks who grew up using this technology, right? So, like for most of us, it's teenage, college, early thirties. Um, really, the concern here is that there's an entire generation who are from toddlerhood, even already using smartphones, tablets, um, and we're starting to to question what the effects are on just kind of basic human psychology um, from using these devices at that young of an age. Um, some of the stuff I... I you know, and I think particularly how they're used at that age. What do you mean by that, Will? Well, it's it's one thing for a kid to watch TV shows on a tablet. It's another for the tablet to be treated as a pacifier mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. the kid's parents. It works um, wonderfully. It does. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it does, but <laughs> the context of that use feels unhealthy. Um, you're you're supplanting some means of care with. That that Netflix tablet, and sometimes when you're really exhausted, that's you just got it. I it's haven't been a left. parent yet. I'm. Yeah. It's going to be a trip. Um, <laughs> well, I'll I'll share an anecdote. Uh, my my partner was um, out on the walk, saw a a young mom, clearly exhausted, pushing a pram uh, uh, with a, a, like a one one and a half year old sitting in there holding her mom's phone, watching I don't know Blue's Clues or something, right? And the question was. Who is self? Who is self soothing here? <laughs> the, and the answer is they probably both are, right? Like you're a tired parent, you just give them the device, and they're quiet and content for like an hour, and and you need that, right? Um, but there's all kinds of I, I, like when I call this a grand experiment, it's because we don't know during a developmental stage what this will do um, to these kids' patterns of thinking patterns of even socialization. Like it's one thing when you adopt this once your neural pathways are already relatively formed. Like Aaron's pretty much in concrete by the by the time he gets a phone. He's 31. His brain is functioning the way it's gonna function. Right. And even in no your twenties. No changing him now. No, it's you can't teach an old dog new new smartphone tricks, is I think the the saying. Um but the reason why I think folks are concerned is because when you use these devices it's an active device, yeah. So it's not just like watching a screen, but that activity has been designed by developers to encourage kind of basic primitive chemical releases in the brain. So when you do certain things on your phone, you get rewarded with a dopamine rush. Your, your body gives you a little exhilaration, like, hey, good job. And that a lot of the software is programmed to provide that. Like they're actually consciously thinking these days. They have, you know, neuro um, uh, neurologists. They have folks with training in brain chemistry who are working with designers. How can we get folks essentially addicted? Uh, it's just, it may be problematic to call that addiction, but get them hooked on using the software and continuing to use it. So, I mean, what strikes me as interesting yeah. about that in in this context is. It's always been the case that product designers want to design products that are engaging. Yeah. Right. And so you you want this to be a product that people are going to use a lot because then they're going to recommend it to friends or they're going to want to buy the next version of it or whatever else. But there there was always a distance between you as the product designer and kind of the use of the product. And the only way to so A, you couldn't really measure. You know, like if Wired Magazine prints out a um, print edition of their magazine and mails it to people, they can they can measure like are people resubscribing, are they canceling their subscriptions, are subscription rates growing, but they can't really see how people are using this magazine. Maybe they can get a sense of like sales for advertisers went up by X amount when this thing went out, but you it's there's this it's pretty crude. It's, yeah. it's pretty yeah. crude. Um, whereas now you have, I mean, they can 
instantly they can be measuring you in effectively real time as you're using the app and it's pinging back to the server and it's not just measuring when you were to buy an egg beater say after buying it the egg beater company wasn't making any more or less money whether you used it regularly or not but when it comes to facebook or really anything else with an ad driven model every minute you're spending there is revenue for the company right but even even if even if it's a sales like it's a one off sales of the app they can still they they can be measuring this stuff and then they can be tweaking this stuff and then the difference the other difference too is when you buy that egg beater even if they later are like oh there's a there's better ways to make this egg beater and they release egg beater version 1.5 you're not going to get that unless you decide to go out and buy another egg beater. And for a lot of products, we just don't buy new ones until the old one breaks. But they can now push the updates out to you in either real time if it's websites um, or close to it if it's over the air updates. And so you can create these feedback loops. But, but one of the things that gets lost then or I guess one of the – I think the results of that is that when you are the product designer designing – a product designer has a lot of values they're trying to bake into this product. And so there's there's considerations like you want a product that works well, but also like we want a product that has certain aesthetic qualities. We want a product that has a certain feel to use. We want a product that we can be proud of. Like these are all values that exist, but the feedback loop of testing plus instant optimization, I think in a lot of cases crowds out all other considerations in designing the product except engagement. There's, um, I think it's from uh, Tristan Harris, who was an Apple engineer, Google manager, and actually was Google's internal design ethicist was his title. Now he's he's left to basically complain about how terrible all these things he helped create are. Um, but he, I, I'm pretty sure it was him who gave the illustration of how on Instagram they'll they'll track their users and they've noticed that certain users will. Um, they respond favorably. They engage more when instead of releasing notifications of likes whenever they happen. So someone liked your Instagram post and so you get, oh, that person liked that notification. Oh, that person liked the notification. They've noticed that some people uh, respond better when they cluster the likes so that the dopamine rush is bigger when instead of one every five minutes, you get a batch of five in half an hour and suddenly five people liked my post and it, it, it triggers that dopamine release more powerfully. So like, and they can do that on the fly. And I mean, it's not some literal engineer for each person calculating that their algorithm, their eight artificial intelligence systems are, are doing that for you without any kind of human oversight. And they just say, here's, we want to maximize these results track individual people, figure out what gets them to engage more and more and more. Is, is that wholly a, a dopamine chasing story? I mean, I, I notice that yeah. on Twitter when uh, I've said something foolish and a bunch of people are dunking on me, um, I won't get all of those notifications at once. I'll get them in a staggered fashion. Oh, and yeah, for yeah. me, I, you know, if I'm getting a couple hundred people chiming in or liking or whatever else, I don't, I don't want yeah. a constant stream of notifications. I'd thought. rather yeah. those be packaged and given to me every half hour rather than my phone just dinging constantly. So I it's a good thought. I don't yeah. know. I can see other reasons why you might want to do something like that. Yeah. Um, but certainly the uh in the way Harris presents it feels but pernicious. I think one of the I mean, one of the points or takeaways of this this production cycle is that in the past, a product designer would have had to sit down and think about how this product might be used and make those kinds of considerations. Like say, do I think, and based on the evidence that I might have, which is going to be a little bit rough, um, do I think that I'm going to get more engagement by clustering versus uh, dripping them out at a, at a more even pace? And is is engagement like is the kind of engagement that creates the kind of engagement I want? Is it going to have lead lo to long term less use of the product, or is it going to you know hurt my brand reputation because people will feel addicted, whatever? But now they you don't even need to make that decision. You can just be like, well, what I'm going to do is is put out two versions of the app. 
like randomly assign people to buckets yeah. and see what works. And I'm going to optimize on the measurables because you can then, I mean, it's, it's nice to be able to go to your boss and say, look, all the measurables have gone up. Um, and it might be the case then too that like, Will, you seem to respond better when they're clustered, but Paul, you seem to respond better when they're spaced out. And so you guys are going to get what you get. And from the from some the perspective, I mean, this causes kind of you can imagine someone who, who is not a libertarian looking at this, someone who doesn't who who's sees their kind of natural inclination is to see things and be like, well, what what role could the state play in this? Like this seems almost like the market breaking in a certain interesting way, right? Because you've got you've got people, product designers, following incentives. Their incentive is they want their product to stay in business. These are com incredibly competitive markets. The advertising margins are razor thin. So every last bit of engagement is important. So they're simply following reasonable incentives. But the result in the aggregate is that our phones are filled with these things that have been like laser focused designed to just make us behave like the rat just hitting the thing to get yeah. you know the treat over and over again which most of us think is on the whole not a good way to live well it's causing right? burnout right it's causing it's yeah. it's you know and like if we could step back and and inject other values into the design process we might say like we try to design different products but but each individual actor that you can't be the actor who does that because then it all it means is that your app is just not going to get used as much as the other ones and it's going to go under. You're not going to so get the funding. The, you're not going to boost your stock price. And yeah, is like, this yeah. the kind of situation where what you need is an outside third party that has a different set of values to kind of impose and say no, you need to you know we need to put a limit on this or you need to pursue other values. Is that the only way out of this kind of vicious cycle? That would be a real twist for a Cato podcast for us to be like, actually, we do need the state to step in that now. So, I mean, it, it's a is a reasonable line of argument, right? You can get it's, – it's logically proceeding from some prior assumptions. I think as we look at what's happening though, we see adjustment being made without state action. And we can talk about that some here. I mean, even, even Tristan Harris, who I just mentioned, he's part of an organization uh, called the Center for Humane Technology. He's joined by the guy who invented the infinite scroll um, as a Raskin. Uh, there's a number of former engineers who are all saying, wait a second, we didn't intend for it to be like this or to get this bad. Let's roll this back. Even Apple and Google, as we will talk about here in a bit, they've started to introduce measures to discourage people to use their products as much functionally. And we can, we'll, we'll talk about that. Like we're seeing uh, voluntary self-organized action. So, I mean, th I mean, I think that's the libertarian answer is that we don't need the state to do this. In fact, if they try to do it, they'll be super clumsy about it. I mean, all I have to do is watch a congressional hearing of a, of the, you know, of a Google CEO the other day to realize how ham-fisted. Yeah, you shall and... check out Will's Twitter feed during any of these hearings because it's just him banging his head into the desk over and over. I can again. come by the office and just hear, I hear me it banging through my, my door. Head, yeah, yeah, you know? I can hear it down the hall. Um, so I mean, there's, I mean, there. I, I think we can rely on the market to correct its own failure here. But in thinking about like, is this market failure? Perhaps, but what I think of it, what's interesting is to the extent to which it's just human failure. In as much as we 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 decided for a variety of interesting historically contingent happenstance reasons, we gave a bunch of like twenty something year old often college grads, college dropouts, but they're, they're young, most of whom who don't have training in the humanities and ethics and philosophy in why or whether you should do things. They just have training. They have the skill set to make stuff. And then we told them make things people use a lot. And they did that and didn't appreciate the ramifications of it. I mean, in this, so, so you take, take like the infinite scroll. Is that scroll. all that? That novel? I mean, you look at the creation of the interstate highway system or the Manhattan Project or I... I don't think they were that young, right? Um, plenty of them were. I don't know. Maybe well, I'm... But let me put it this way. So, I mean, I think Aaron mentioned this in conversation off the air, which was that what's different is the, the kind of adoption curve. So let's say you create a new interstate highway system. Yeah, there's all these unintended knock-on effects for... Oh, and you're designing for a very specific purpose Design without specific a whole purpose. lot of thought given to the broader second order effects of what you're building. Right. 
and that affects you know, first of all, hundreds of thousands of people. And then as it starts to reorganize the built structure of America, millions of people, now hundreds of millions of people. So there's a curve over the better course of a century of it transforming American society. You can change, you can create the infinite scroll and within a year, billions of people around the world One are, generation are using more. this, right? So the, it, there's a scale, exponential curve in adoption rates that's going on that's um, that that's I think uh, significant here. Um, you, so uh, I, I think that makes a difference. That just the sheer scale of adoption, the speed of it, and the fact that you have young folks who weren't trained to think about these questions, making those decisions and experimenting. I mean, we're all the we're, we are all either part of the experiment or the control group, um, and that's that's curious. I, mean, I think that is different and and interesting. So what do we have so far in terms of hard data on the effects of this? I mean, obviously, again, it, it is all still pretty new, but you look at someone my age and uh, I, I grew up with dial-up, got a smartphone, and here I am today in, in the the app web, web 2.0 environment. Um, there, well, so there are some like – there's a, a big longitudinal study – and the science is always behind the tech, right? So, but there's a big, I think uh, as Harvard is running the adolescent brain cognitive developmental study with like 10,000 plus kids involved. So they're gonna track and they're gonna track basically an entire generation of kids who are born into this tech, unlike us who got it mid development or later um, and what the effects are gonna be over the next couple of decades. So, I mean, I don't think we're gonna have the best data for a while yet. But the early results, um, there was a, there's was a. there been some good pieces talking about the generational order effects. I mean, uh, I know, Aaron, you you, can't, you despise millennials, but- um, I don't despise them. I just, you know, <laughs> they're doing the best they can. <laughs> In the broken world we've been left. The broken world we've been left. Um, that millennials, but especially Gen Z, are having- uh, less like I guess you could call these upsides in a sense. They have less sex, about a third fewer sexual partners on average. They're sexually active a year or two later on average in high school. They take fewer drugs. They have less criminal behavior by half than Gen X or or boomers. Um, the flip side of that is they also have significantly higher depression rates, a higher suicide rate, and this is harder to measure. But it kind of goes with the criminality and sex and the drugs. They're less – they might be less anti-authoritarian, which I think is interesting to think through as a libertarian. Um, so there's almost an, uh, an anesthetizing effect. They don't have rock technology. and roll either. No, the it's, rock and roll is dead. dead. So the sex, drugs, and rock and roll is gone for an entire generation. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't know how people like that can turn out OK. <laughs> um how how confident should we be that all of these effects are linked to tech? I mean, couldn't it just as likely be, say, the fact that they all lived through the Great Recession, watched their parents lose their jobs, and maybe have uh, and had less going out money as kids, um, and and became risk averse as a result of just watching that collapse? I think that's as plausible as the idea that it's all smartphone driven. Uh, Tess just pointed out that Gen Z has Halsey. Does that mean something to you? Yeah, Aaron? Halsey's fun. Good driving music. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> oh, she's like a you know synth pop princess. I, but I think we can all. I mean, we can bracket the like. What kind of scientific data do we have? Is it is it too early to have much data because we haven't had people who have really been raised, kind of immersed in this stuff from day one, um, <clears throat> and also the the causal questions, Will, that you raised um, of how much of this stuff is caused by the tech versus other environmental things or cultural things or whatever else. But I think it's the case that all of us who have a smartphone can recognize mm. our own addiction to the smartphone. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, can, totally. Like, but I feel and, like and that's can, on and me. And you can recognize like, you know, so I can, I can see how prior to having a smartphone or prior to having a smartphone that was good enough that I actually wanted to use it fairly regularly, that that early Android phone was not, um, that that I am, have a harder time to, with sustained focus, say. Like I have a harder time just like sitting down and reading a book 
for a couple of hours the way that I used to. Um, it's probably very good that I didn't have a smartphone in college and law school because I probably would not have done as well. Um, like we, we can – the kind of subjective experience is both very real for most of us and appears to be incredibly uniform among tech I, users. So I don't I, – I still can't help but think of it in terms of individual responsibility, in intentionality and I, I could be off base there but – I can pick up my phone and I can bounce around on tw uh, Twitter or just scroll through Facebook without, you know, aimlessly. Um, or I can open the Amazon Kindle app and keep reading whatever novel I, I was into on my smartphone. And it's up to me to choose which of those things I want to do. I, I just often sure. don't approach the use of technology with as much intentionality as I ought to and neither do other people. But so, so let's say I don't see that as a tech issue. I... If we put this, put this like addiction question in a sense because we're kind of talking about like we don't blame addicts as much as we blame – there's this sense in which it overwhelms your like you know conscious decision-making process and – so we're having a, an addiction conversation here. You put that in another I can't context. Can't read a novel on my crack pipe, though. Right, but, well, here, but so so do we blame someone who uses drugs for the decision to become addicted to you know opioids? Right. Well, yeah, we do. I mean, there's individual responsibility, but we also note that there's all these structural factors and unintended consequences of essentially the FDA and a uh, cartel of pharmaceutical companies pushing opioid a use on people as well. Like, I mean, so it's both like a structural pipeline issue um, and individual responsibility and raising awareness and there's all these unintended ill effects. So, I mean, and it's obviously not as severe as opioid addiction, but um, if we think of it in that context, I think it, it, we don't have to choose between, yeah, it's your fault, Will, for being obsessed with Twitter and, you know, dunking on. I mean, it is though. It is my fault. I ought to use technology better. But this is, I, I mean. I fail to do so. It, but you can – ultimately the agency rests with you and we can say like yeah, it's not the tech's fault because the tech doesn't have agency. It can't make you pick it up. Like it can't I downloaded make you use Twitter it. and made an account in the first place. I could have never started down that path. But it's also the case that the environment in which we find ourselves makes – can make good behavior, however we want to define it um, or the kind of behavior that we would aspire to uh, easier or harder. Um, and so, yeah, but that's not just the phone environment. That's you know how I've well, architected my Saturday morning. If I don't eat breakfast and don't get out of bed well, and just well, lay there for two hours, two hours in, I am much more likely to just pick up the phone and scroll through it. If I get up and go for a run and eat a good breakfast, uh, the phone doesn't have the same appeal. So this this takes some of the onus off off if you will. You can rest easy now. No, so just like I was blaming twenty something year old um, under. Uh, aware designers for doing things they didn't understand the second order effects of. Well, that same thing is true of us. Like we have it. It's not like we were aware that, oh, if I use this tech, it's going to really f drastically change my daily experience and my brain chemistry until really the last couple of years. We're starting to wake up to the fact that, oh, every time I get a notification, um, there is a cortisol response in my body. My body pumps a chemical into my brain. That, that it's the fight or flight hormone and the cortisol. So every time I get that notification, my body says, oh, you got to do something. And then, which is why you reflexively look at your phone when you get the notifications. And the companies structure those notifications to try to trigger either dopamine releases from good ones, cortisol triggers uh, from, from bad ones. And that builds in a kind of base level constant routine anxiety. Now we when you made the decision to use any of those apps, you weren't so aware two, of, two, of any of that. Two points you on didn't that. have the knowledge you needed to make a, 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 a um, an educated decision in that regard, right? I think one, one I can use the app without getting the notifications all the time. You should turn the notifications off. And frankly, it's rather amusing that with this panic about brain hacking and tech addiction, the one notification now you struggle to turn off on your phone is the one that pops up every day telling you how long you've been on your phone. Yes, but we that's information we have now or in the last year or two. 
2016, no one's talking about dopamine and cortisol and the effects of infinite scroll and the effects of, right? Like no, but this you, is a you new can conversation, look at how new you've information. you made use of some app and think about whether it's healthy or not. If you're on Tinder, say, and you're matching with people, but you aren't really sending them messages, you're just getting a little warm glow knowing that someone likes you because you don't feel like going out, whatever. You can look at that and say, I'm not using this in a very healthy fashion. I don't think I need knowledge about how dopamine is is rolling around my brain to make to draw that conclusion. But this brings up the other thing we talk about, which is this and what you raised in response to the like, shouldn't there be a law question about the tech companies starting to bake into because so one of the things is you have to recognize like part of realizing you have a problem, you know? And so the Hi, my Android name is Paul. and IOLs have in you know in recent updates have baked in applications that will tell you how long you've been using a given app, how long you use your phone, how often you pick it up, how often you unlock it, that kind of stuff. And even even someone who's kind of subjectively aware of, oh, I'm on my phone a lot. The first time you get those numbers, they're presented to you like today you spent X number of hours on Twitter and opened it up once every six minutes or whatever. You're, it's just – it's like mind blowing, yeah. and you just are kind of embarrassed and hope no one sees those numbers. Yeah. You know, in the same, it's the same reaction as when you know you used to hear these stats about like how much the average American watch TV, and you'd be like, God, how can anyone possibly watch that many hours of TV? And then it's like you're doing three times that much Twitter every day. You know, so so the tech is. I think before it was – it's harder to know and especially when you're in an embedded environment. So when I take the metro home or take the bus home from work each day, every single person it's, – it's rare to see someone who isn't on their phone. Um, and so you're in an embedded environment which is just kind of acceptable or the fact that all of us during the half an hour we've been talking – have checked our phones multiple Mine times. Mine is on airplane mode. I have checked the time and nothing it, I, else. You can is, all check it this. It still is checking the phone. So yeah, yeah. Th this is, you know, we, oh, we're kind of we're so embedded in a culture that does this. And so then the question is, can the tech push us back out of this by by giving us by I mean this kind of nudge of like, well, you're using it too much, or enabling me in the you know Ulysses asking his men to tie him to the the mast of the ship, right? Yeah, like, yeah. like I know that I lack the willpower to overcome this, so what I want you to do, Apple, is lock me out of Twitter after 20 minutes each day. Oh, and you've you've long had you know even browser apps that will keep you from visiting certain sites while you're trying to study. One, I mean, very minor marginal design feature shift in the latest generation of uh, Pixel phones that I, I like from this perspective is uh, it will give you an option to turn notifications off when you set the phone face down and, and there's a nice physicality that accompanies that sort of do not disturb. Um, Functionally, it's healthy to build in breaks. I mean all these things are whether it's your phone, your, your – uh, um, your iWatch, Apple, Apple Watch, Watch Apple. <laughs> obviously, I don't have one. An Apple Watch that's saying, "Hey, take a, a minute to breathe. You'll live twenty years longer, or I don't know, a thousand years longer, whatever." It, it, if you do, or it's your app telling you, "I think Tess, don't you have a? Does your phone tell you to get off at ten thirty or something like that?" Hi guys. <laughs> yes, my um, app tells me at ten thirty it's time to go to bed, and usually at that time I'm scrolling through Instagram. So did did you set the ten thirty? Yeah, okay. yeah, I have it set for at ten o'clock. It reminds me it's almost bedtime, and at ten thirty my screen shuts down, and it shows this little um, what would you call it the sand thing? Oh yeah, um, yeah, the time, yeah, yeah, the timer saying it's time to go to bed and your screen time is D does done it, for the day. <laughs> when you get to 1030, does it read the, the children's storybook, um, go the fuck to sleep? I mean, oh, I wait. wish. Oh, whoa, <laughs> this is a family <laughs> podcast. <That's right. laughs> Wasn't thinking of that though? when I said that. Yeah, is, is it, it though? though? Is it? Um, I, I did recommend diapers in our Thanksgiving No, but episode. you can get that on YouTube now. So um, um, No, but it also gives me the option to like extend my time on whatever app I'm using by 15 uh, okay. more minutes and yeah, then yeah, yeah. in 15 minutes it tells me to go to sleep. Like the opposite of a snooze function. Yeah. I like that. Uh, yeah. I think the where, where it can get very interesting there is when the application will actually incentivize you 
um, with reference to your in-app goals to log off for a while. You think about something like the rested experience function in World of Warcraft. When, when, when you're offline, it'll build up a bar of double experience. Yeah. And while you're playing, that, that doesn't build up. So the idea is yeah, that you know don't don't yeah. binge it. Take a few hours off, and frankly, you'll be benefited for doing so. So I mean, it, it, you know, and you're right. Like we're building in break systems, a way of incur of incentivizing, nudging people into getting off their device, getting out of a program, and spending some some time IRL in real life. But uh, um, and 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 this is a this is voluntary. It's not requiring state action. I think that's encouraging from a libertarian perspective. But this is a very old concept, and if I can take a moment to step back and put on my historian hat, so it's history time, which is just like hammer time, but with way worse pants, um, <laughs> better pants. Um, this was a question actually in literature. So if you go all the way back to the 18th century, uh, it used to be that writing didn't have chapter divisions. That was actually somewhat unusual. So you wouldn't divide things into chapters, it was just one long, you know, litany of, of words. And one of the innovations in, in the early novel was we're gonna break that up. We're going to divide it into chapters, which incentivizes, nudges people into taking a break. So Henry Fielding, who's an 18th century novelist said, quote, those little spaces between our chapters are an inn or resting place where he may stop and take a glass or any other refreshment as it pleases him. So there, like this is this this idea of this as a tech is pre-digital. It is very old. The idea of when people are engaged with with some kind of mode of entertainment or or in, uh, any kind of engagement really, it is natural from a design perspective to build in breaks, and that in so doing, even though it discourages sheer quantity of engagement, it makes it more sustainable and more enjoyable for the user. So functionally, what Google and Apple, all these companies are doing in response to these concerns are implementing four-century-old tech into our devices, which I think is kind of cool, right? Um, it's a very old conversation being applied in a new well, the way. Whole, I, th I think the whole conversation is, is quite old outside of technology. It's also difficult to live intentionally, to be mindful of how you're interacting with others, making use of technologies, et cetera. It's not localized I, to the smartphone. It's hard to be a I virtuous person. Wanted your your kind of literature structure as tech, it, it reminds me, it can go in the other direction too. I'm, I'm reminded of the um, crime novelist Ed McBain or Evan Hunter, is, it was his real name um, that he wrote under that and Ed McBain, but he, he – talked once about how he would try to structure paragraphs to make the page easier to read so that the the reader just like kept going because the text you – because know, it's you, – you encounter a giant block of text and it's like a hurdle to overcome. You read it slower or you lose your place. So if you break things up in certain ways or you have the dialogue flow in certain ways, he figured out he get his readers. Well, so I mean you've got the – and plus how do – how would most crime novels they still have chapters. How do they end the chapter? A cliffhanger, right. right? So you want them to take a break, but you want them to come back. I'm sure we could think of tech corollaries for your smartphone. Yes, you know, uh, Google might at 1030 tell Tess to, to go the F to sleep, but next morning it's going to have a bunch of notifications just pinging away. Come back, Tess. Come back. Um, it, it makes that sound, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> no, because my notifications are turned off, except for oh. my Cato notification. You're so when better. you guys are texting me at ten o'clock, where's the podcast? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, you're so much better than you're so much better than me, Tess. Um, the so okay, so we have these responses to this problem, uh, design choices being made. Uh, maybe on another um, kind of on another angle to take on this. Are programs specifically designed to help us be more, to use Will's word here, mindful, mindfulness software? Am I using, is it mindfulness? Yeah. Is that yes. the kind of phrase? Yeah. And there, there's apps that help you 
meditate. I understand, Aaron, that there's a, an app that will that promises to enlighten you at like Buddha-like levels well, within I, the day or two. I'd probably not. That's such a <laughs> promise would be hard to fulfill. But um, yeah, no, there's, I mean, the, then there's the tech that is, so, so far we've been talking about tech that addicts us or tech that kind of makes us unmindful in the way we're approaching things and then ways that the tech can kind of place stop gaps to prevent us from going down that road. But then there's this whole line of tech that is supposed to kind of elevate our level of focus and our level of mindfulness. Um, and so, yeah, you see, I mean, some of those popular apps in the app store are these guided meditation apps. So Headspace is probably the the most popular one. Um, and they're lots and lots of people use them. They make a ton of money. You know, executives in Silicon Valley like encourage a employees to use these sort of things. Hmm. Um, I my, my mini rant about them, which is why you teed this <laughs> up because I've made this rant before, is um, guided meditation apps are if your if your goal is kind of the sort of mindfulness that meditation is supposed to cultivate. So so this generally like Buddhist practice of mindfulness meditation focus on the breath. It's called Vipassana. Um, if that's your goal, mindfulness like Guided meditation apps like Headspace are just don't don't bother. They're, they're not so because these these are techniques. This kind of focus thing is a technique that takes ninety seconds to learn. It's very easy. It's just focus on the breath, and when your mind drifts away, focus on the breath, and when it drifts away, focus on the breath. And so having you know having someone explain it to you like a you know a, a five minute guided meditation that just gets you here's how it kind of works um, is all you need. And then. The these apps are like, well, you're there. Here's a ten minute meditation on leadership. It's like, no, what you're listening to <laughs> is a soothing, slow paced TED talk on leadership while pretending yeah. to meditate. Uh, so it's like one of those things out that like a movie from the '80s where they pop in the cassette and it's like, you are a strong and powerful person. Be a leader today. Yes. And yes. Like, yeah. So it's it's affirmations <laughs> or something, but it's not it's not mindfulness yeah. meditation, and it's. It certainly is not helping you improve your mindfulness meditation because I think it's actively interfering with it. So if you're if you're serious about pursuing that, just get yourself a timer and sit there and focus on the breath. But there are ways that tech could be used to help, if not improve, at least gauge the efficacy of meditation. I mean, all of this, yeah. So this is the kind of out there, you know, the the. 10, 20 years down the road of where does tech as a way not only to, you know, tech right now kind of interferes with our ability to focus and live mindfully, which is the, the theme that a lot of people pick up from, from all of this, um, then you can see kind of almost, you want to call them sci-fi stuff, but they're not that far off, which is like if, if focus, focus is just a mental state. Right, being being in a state of focus, of mindfulness, of like awareness, of non-distraction, or whatever you want to call it, is simply a brain state, and we can measure brain states. Then you can imagine all sorts of crazy like biofeedback, like think yourself into this state, and the machine will kind of buzz or give you some indicator when you're there, so you know very clearly, oh, this is what that feels like, and. As you drift away, okay, that's what's drifting it away. And as you drift towards, okay, that's what. And and you can imagine it like radically accelerating our ability to cultivate these kinds of traits and mental states that, like a metal detector for enlightenment. <laughs> beep beep beep! You're getting close. Right? Are those things <laughs> the Scientologists detect? E meters. They, yeah. Wow! With oh, the, we don't need to go there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so you could see. I mean, this is the interesting thing. Is I think I think that. When the the it feels like the era we're in with this kind of technology, with smartphones, with apps, with social media, with kind of addictive tech, feels incredibly pervasive right now. It's everywhere, and it feels like this is just the way things are, and it's just going to get worse because like these people are going to figure out even more sophisticated ways to get us using their stuff. Um, but I suspect that in ten or twenty years, this. This culture that we live in of like everybody on the bus staring into their smartphones all the time and like the moment you get onto the elevator, the first thing you do is you're riding up three floors because you've got that extra 20 seconds of time is pull out your phone and, you know, reload the Washington Post or whatever. Like that's going to look incredibly bizarre to people not too far into the future and they're just be like, what were wrong with these people? Like they just – it's – I think that this this problem – will be solved. It'll probably be solved both through cultural shifts, through kind of awareness as we all, you know, suddenly become aware that this stuff is addictive in a way that we weren't. 
five years ago, or at least weren't talking about. Um, and as the, the underlying technology and as the people who are making this technology say, oh, I forgot there are other values that matter and they're values that matter not just to kind of me as a human being, like I don't want to be creating a world where everyone is addicted, but also as consumers start to say, I don't want to buy tech that's simply addicting me. I want to buy tech. It's, it's like these are features worth paying for to have tech that's going to help me out or is you know, it's not going to just not addict me, but maybe even take it further and help me yeah. in these regards. And so I, I think that this conversation to some extent in 10 years is going to look kind of silly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we're at kind of peak concern, right? Like we're at that inflection point where folks are just on a kind of mass level starting to wake up to, oh, this – yes, I've noticed that when I get off you know, social media, I feel happier and when I engage, I feel miserable. But like that's a real problem that we should think about collectively and do something about. Like we're at that peak. We're start entering that peak inflection moment. We're going to start to do that. We're going to start to kind of solve the problem. Um, it's not – I'm actually reminded of a previous bit of a tech panic, I guess we could call it, which is the concerns in, in the 1950s and 60s over – About pinball machines? Well, that actually would fit pinball to work. It's going to corrupt the whole generation and so got to use state power to stamp out the pinball machines. No, uh, I was thinking market marketing, basically Mad Men, the Mad Men, you know, that modern advertising was going to corrupt our minds. We were – they didn't use the word brainwash in this uh, – maybe. Uh, Anyways, we were basically being brainwashed by advertising. We were against our will. There's nothing you can do. They're so clever in how they can manipulate sound and image and ideas to create captive audiences and we're all mindlessly consuming and the modern ad man is is the god of, but tech, of consumption. Tech fixed that with uh, they live glasses and then you can see the advertising zombies and avoid them. You're fine. <laughs> That's right. Um, well, but it, it's the same kind of thing. Like there was a moment of peak concern and functionally everyone said, hmm, this is a problem. Maybe we should be more why And like we're not worried about that to the same extent because we all kind of wised up as a society, right? We're not as mindlessly to following advertising like the folks were worried about in the late 40s and early 50s. And I think the same thing could apply here. And just as we look back about those concerns as being a little bit paranoid now, folks will do that down the line like you're saying, Aaron. I, I can imagine that. Um, and maybe this should mitigate um, – one last thought here. This is something you shared, Will, was uh, an article uh, by John Richardson for the Intelligencer, The Children of Ted – this is like kind of the extreme opposite reaction. We're kind of saying, hey, chill out. It'll be OK. But there's another group who are kind of going oh, the opposite well, just, direction. They're just Neo Kaczynskiists. Um, the Unabomber, right? Ted Kaczynski? Yeah. And, and they see the fruits of industrial society as being, if not universally, at least um, on balance, um, negative or disastrous for humanity. Um, I think there are some libertarian concerns there, um, though more broadly, um, there's a, a naturalism inherent to it that uh, is often at, at cross purposes with the kind of human liberatory elements of, of libertarianism. You could almost do a whole whole episode on that. We probably should in we their should own right, it. but. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not liberal stuff, you know. When you look at the the world you imagine coming about after the industrial society has been sabotaged and collapses, it's uh, red in tooth and claw and fairly fascistic in terms of uh, how one how a survivor might go through their life. Yeah, well, it's something of that that you know. Uh, uh, to, tune in, tune on, drop out. I'm trying. I can't remember the phrase. Turn on, tune in, drop out. Turn on, drop out. Leary's phrase, right? Like, there's a – we're going – description of these, yeah, proto Kaczynskiite willing to use violence to tear down the industrial order, willing to kill people uh, in order to do so uh, on a massive scale if, if possible who, you know, they're going back. They're like – they're they're camping in the woods, learning survival skills, learning to be blacksmiths, forging their own hatchets. There's like this – primitive return to nature component to it. I'm not sure that's going to uh, – I mean it's going to remain on the fringe and, and uh, I'm not sure that's a I, – I don't think many of our listeners are, are saying, hmm, I'm really annoyed with the cortisol response I'm getting from my Google apps. I'm going to go you know, 
mail send mail bombs to people. So I'm not also, sure. Just yeah, like good good luck. Um, <laughs> in, industrial societies are hard nut to crack. Obviously, there's some uh, potential failure points, power grids, that kind of thing. But more more broadly. Um, I think they've got their work cut out for them, <laughs> and right. uh, thankfully so. Yeah. We don't want to talk about their New Year's resolutions for 2019. Um, I think on that note, we have somehow managed to go from um, uh, all the way from meditation apps to proto-Kaczynski bombers. Uh, go figure. But uh, that's all we have time for today. So until next week, don't check your phone as much and be well. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.